Welcome to our award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer financial services and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly podcast show brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spar Law Firm. I'm your host, Alan Kaplinsky, the former practice group leader for more than 25 years and now senior counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar. And I will be moderating today's program. For those of you who want even more information, don't forget about our blog, consumerfinancemonitor.com. We've hosted our blog since 2011 when the CFPB became operational. And there's a lot of relevant industry content there. We also regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. So to subscribe to our blog or to get on the list for our webinars, please visit us at ballardspar.com. If you like our podcast, please let us know about it. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, or wherever you obtain your podcasts. Also, please let us know if you have ideas for other topics that we should cover or speakers that we should consider as guests on our show. So today, uh, I am uh, happy to be joined by my colleagues, Rich Andriano, John Colhane, Mike Gordon, and Lisa Lanham. Rich is the practice group leader of our mortgage banking group and the co-chair of our fair lending team in our Washington, D.C. office. He assists clients with preparing for and handling CFPB mortgage-related examinations and enforcement actions and with a variety of mortgage-related regulatory issues. John Culhane is a partner in our Consumer Financial Services Group, who works out of our Philadelphia office. He's known for his works on advising clients on interstate direct and indirect consumer loan and leasing programs. John's practice includes preparing clients for banking agency and CFPB compliance examinations and assisting in the defense of attorney general investigations and banking agencies and CFPB enforcement actions. Mike Gordon is a partner in our Consumer Financial Services Group based in our Washington, D.C. office. Mike is a former senior CFPB official uh, with over two decades of experience in consumer financial services law. Mike focuses on enforcement defense, compliance and exam readiness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And uh, uh, Mike is one of the two uh, new members of our Consumer Financial Services Group. Uh, When I say new, meaning that uh, they joined us last year. Uh, And finally, last but not least, uh, I'm happy to introduce Lisa Lanham who is in our mortgage banking group and our consumer financial services group. And she co-leads our firm's fintech and payment solutions team. Her practices focuses on financial services matters related to state licensing and federal approvals that are necessary to conduct business for a variety of asset classes and market participants. So today, uh, we're going to be repurposing a uh, very successful webinar that uh, we recently conducted entitled The CFPB's Proposals to Create Two Public Registries for Non-Banks, What You Need to Know. And today, we will focus on part one of the webinar. Uh, next week will be part two. Part one will concentrate or will focus on the very first public registry proposed by the CFPB that would require non-banks to register with and submit information to the CFPB for publication 
in an online publicly available database. And that proposal would require companies to register when as a result of judgments or settlements uh, or otherwise they become subject, subject to orders from local, state, or federal agencies and courts involving violations of the consumer protection laws. Part two next week would require companies to register if they use certain terms or conditions in form contracts, such as waivers of consumer rights and arbitration provisions, regardless of whether such terms or conditions are lawful. Both of these proposals are a very aggressive attempt by the CFPB to enhance its supervisory and enforcement authority. Uh, And they carry very significant potential implications for all non-banks that are in the consumer finance industry. So um, I am now going to turn to the first registry. And I'm calling it the orders registry. Uh, it got published in the Federal Register on January 30th. Uh, comments are due by March 31. We're helping a number of clients uh, uh, provide input with respect to comment letters on uh, this proposal. And if you're interested in uh, talking to us about that, Uh, of course, we'd be happy uh, to talk to you. Uh, As a general overview, and we're going to drill down much deeper on this, it covers certain, quote, covered non-banks, unquote, that would be required to register with and submit certain information to the CFPB when they become subject to certain orders from local, state, or federal agencies or courts, and that includes settlements involving violations of certain consumer protection laws. And we'll enumerate that later in the program. I already referred to the additional annual attestation requirement that's going to apply to registered non-banks that are subject to CFPB supervision. Uh, The registry itself will apply to all non-banks that are considered covered non-banks. doesn't matter whether or not the non-bank is already being supervised and examined by the CFPB. The other important point here is that the registration information will be publicly available on the Bureau's website. Um, So this is the... um, legal authority being relied upon by the CFPB, uh, sections 1022, uh, section 1024. Uh, I'm not going to read these provisions. Uh, You can look at them. Uh, I would say as a general matter that this first registry, probably while I think it's very bad policy uh, and and, uh, overkill, Uh, it is probably going to be difficult to challenge from a legal standpoint. The second registry, on the other hand, uh, I think there are stronger grounds uh, for um, uh, going to court to uh, challenge the CFPB uh, about it. So um, let me just make a, um, I guess you could say, an editorial comment. Uh, According to the CFPB, This registry will allow it to more effectively monitor and reduce the risks to consumers uh, posed by so-called repeat offenders. And, of course, we've heard that mantra many times from Rohi Chopra. Uh, He does not uh, like people uh, who uh, repeatedly violate the law, uh, and he is... This is one of many aspects of uh, a, a basically a mosaic that he has uh, put together uh, to go after repeat offenders. However, uh, the industry has raised serious concerns about the Bureau's proposed registry 
including that it seems more like a name and shame tactic rather than a useful tool. In our view, the registry bears great similarity to the CFPB's disclosure of unverified anecdotal complaint data in its consumer complaint database. Since the creation of the database, a primary concern of industry and one which we have often noted in our blog has been that because complaints are often invalid, they don't serve as reliable evidence that the complaint about conduct occurred. The proposed rule would require registration of consent orders, not just litigated cases, not just judgments. Uh, in most consent orders, the company doesn't admit any wrongdoing. Indeed, enforcement actions are very often resolved through consent orders, not because the company is engaged in the wrongful conduct that was alleged uh, by the uh, uh, enforcement agency, but because enforcement actions are very costly to defend and they're a huge drain on a company's resources. So with that introduction, I'm now going to turn the program over to Mike, who's going to do some of the drilling down here. Thanks, Alan. Um, and I completely agree with uh, your editorial comments. Uh, and, and I would add that, you know, the Bureau from its inception has had this dual mandate of supervising banks and non-banks. And it was intentional from Congress. That was uh, the, the idea was we need to level the playing field in terms of federal consumer protection in the financial regulatory space. And the Bureau has struggled with how to how to attack the large and disperse non-bank market. And these registries represent uh, a new tack um, and a novel and really expansive approach to conducting that oversight in the non-bank market participants. And so it is a new frontier that the, the statutory authorities we'll talk about today, you know, exist uh, within the Bureau. And we'll talk about the ones they're relying on, but they're using them under uh, the director uh, under direction of uh, Director Chopra in ways that the Bureau hasn't done before. Both the registration of non-banks, which is a new, you know, they're opening up a new front there, as well as their use of the so-called market monitoring authority, which they rely upon uh, as well for, for uh, in part for these registries. Um, so which kind of entities are going to be covered? These are non-banks for this initial registry we're talking about now. Um, it is... It doesn't include, you know, depositories. Um, it doesn't include states. Um, and the Bureau itself acknowledged how vast this potential community could be. There could be, they said, 155,000 covered non-banks by this uh, orders registry. They, they guesstimate that 1% to 5% may have a covered order um, that would cause them to have to register here. But um, really... Um, you know, those are rough estimates. Um, the There's a subset of this group that is, uh, as we'll discuss later in the webinar, has an additional requirement, not just posting the orders, but having an executive file an attestation. And that's that's a much smaller group. And these, uh, these are companies that are subject to the supervisory jurisdiction of the CFPB and that meet some other thresholds. So, for those who need a refresher, the Bureau's enforcement jurisdiction covers many, many more uh, non-bank entities than its supervisory jurisdiction. And it's that latter subset that has to do the attestation. So we'll cover more about that later, but that has important implications for the companies and what the burdens are. Um, I wonder, as I look at this, whether this pay is going to pave the way for future registries, either expanding on this one by expanding the types of information that need to be su supplied or the types of companies that need to supply it. Uh, but like I said, it's the, it's the opening salvo in this non-bank registry uh, tool that the Bureau was given in, it, in its statute. Um, and of course, it's raised a lot of objections uh, for the reasons uh, that Alan touched on. Uh, you know, for one, one can imagine how... Uh, invested some people might be in the public, uh, not just other regulators, but plaintiff's attorneys and others in seeing 
uh, in one place all of these uh, consent orders or other orders that might provide clues as to further investigation or, or targets for litigation. So with that, I will pass the baton. And thank you very much, Mike, and good day, uh, everyone. Uh, now, one of the important concepts uh, here, in addition to who is covered, is what is covered and what are covered orders. And it is uh, it is defined, and we'll go through the slide and unpack. There's actually a lot of details here uh, that, that the, the rule provides some uh, additional guidance on, but a lot of the guidance is actually in the preamble uh, to this. Now, a covered order... Two initial comments, uh, uh, concepts that are important. It's public and it's final. That's, that's key. And then issued by an agency or court. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit in this list. And then whether or not issued upon uh, consent or involuntary. So consent orders, as Alan did mention, are covered. The problem is a lot of people sometimes enter in consent orders uh, because it's the it's the cheaper thing to do. They think if they went to court, they would win, uh, but that's an expensive uh, endeavor and, and draws a lot of attention from an entity in terms of its executive time, taking depositions, preparing for depositions, uh, supplying documents. That's why a lot of people often agree to a consent order. Uh, uh, that's, that's one problem here with now uh, publishing them the way the Bureau intends to. Now, final really means it is a final order. So, for instance... Uh, preliminary injunction, temporary restraining order, interlocutory orders, those would not be covered. So this is really a final resolution uh, in an order. Public is to get at the point that the Bureau was not trying to venture into confidential supervisory territory, which is non-public. So if an order is non-public because it's supervisory, uh, then it's not covered. If part of an order is not is public in part is not because it's supervisory the part that's not public would not be covered you'd only have to register the, co the covered or public parts uh, of the provisions now uh, it has to identify a covered non-bank as a party subject to the order key here just doesn't have to identify them in the caption you know usually there's a heading cfpb v whatever uh, entity, uh, as long as they're identified in the body uh, of the order as a party being subject to the order, then that's sufficient. However, if they're simply referenced, for instance, let's say someone's uh, XYZ is subject to the order and the order mentions that XYZ uh, has an affiliate ABC, but doesn't say that ABC is subject to the order, it's just providing that information, that wouldn't make ABC uh, an identified party that had to report that that order. So the, either in the caption or in the body, somewhere it has to say XYZ is subject to this order to be identified. Uh, then it has to have been issued by a federal, state, or local agency. Those are defined. Uh, the federal is, is quite broad. Of course, it includes the Bureau itself. It includes all the banking regulators. It includes all the executive departments of the United States, uh, so that's the cabinet level and other departments. It also includes government corporations and what's referred to in some of the statutes they reference as independent establishments. Uh, basically, pretty much every federal agency or entity uh, that can issue orders is going to fall within the definition. It's very, very broad. Uh, similarly with the state, it's uh, they actually define that more specifically rather than by reference to other statutes. Uh, it would include the attorney general or any regulatory or enforcement agency or authority. So not just agencies, it's an authority, and a lot of times at state and local levels you have authorities. They would be covered. Similar a local a regulatory or enforcement agency or authority uh, of a municipality, a city, a county, uh, just that is not a state. That would be that would be local. So a very broad concept again of what uh, what are those agencies. Uh, now again, it has to have public provisions that, but these provisions have to impose obligations on the party that's subject to the order. So. What could that be? Could be uh, an injunction to engage in certain conduct or refrain from engaging in certain conduct. Could be to pay a civil money penalty. 
could be to pay damages or make uh, amends uh, to consumers in some fashion. So it has to be obligations. In contrast, if there was simply a declaratory judgment that said XYZ violated a law, but there were no ramifications coming from that, then that would not that would not be covered. They're looking for orders that impose obligations. And part of the theory is that so the Bureau can somewhat assess are people complying with those uh, obligations. Uh, now, it has to allege uh, and impose obligations in connection with an alleged violation of a covered law. We'll get to that on the next slide. Obviously, a very important concept. And it has an effective date. Notice some retroactivity here of January 1, 2017. This is what uh, the Bureau mulled about a bit. Would it only be orders on or after the effective date of the rule? No, they thought they needed to go back and they picked January 1, 2017. Uh, now, now, the way the rule is proposed, though, Let's say someone was subject to an order uh, dated January 1, 2017, or, or perhaps later. That order would still need to be in effect as of the date the final rule becomes effective to be a covered order. So the, it, you have to look at that. When did it go into effect, and is it still in effect when the rule becomes effective? If the order doesn't state a specific effective date, uh, then the date it is issued will be deemed uh, the effective date uh, by virtue of uh, proposal. Now, so you mentioned covered law, an important concept, uh, and let's see uh, what laws uh, would be covered. Uh, it would, key here is it's, laws sometimes can address a variety of topics. So the covered law, here that we're looking at, the alleged violation would have to be in connection with the offering or provision of a consumer financial product or service. You can get many laws that cover a variety of conduct that goes beyond consumer financial products or services. This is only aimed at consumer financial products or services. And it's a federal consumer financial law or any other laws to which the CFPB has authority over. Uh, this is broad. It includes the Consumer Financial Protection Act. It includes all the Dodd-Frank enumerated statutes, Equal Credit Opportunity, Fair Credit Reporting Act, Truth and Lending Act, Real Estate Southern Procedures Act, the whole laundry list, the alphabet soup, as we refer to it often, of consumer protection regulations. Uh, also uh, would include uh, the Military Lending Act, because the Bureau does have enforcement authority over uh, that act. So it is a broad list of statutes, but again, only to the extent it's addressing the offering of a consumer financial product or service. Then, uh, as you might expect, the Federal Trade Commission's uh, Unfair uh, and Deceptive Acts and Practices uh, in Section 5 of the FTC Act. That is covered. Uh, in addition to that, however, also is any rule issued by the FTC under that authority, or any order issued by the FTC or another agency under that section by authority. However, do you remember, uh, there's also, that section also prohibits unfair competition. That's you know, more of an antitrust concept. That is carved out. That, that, that would not be deemed a covered law. If the violation only relates to unfair competition, it would not uh, be covered. Uh, state laws, again, here, key, they're focusing on unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. What the Bureau has done is listed in Appendix A to the proposal the statutes it thinks that are covered by state. And it includes both general UDAP-type laws, laws that apply to conduct in general, and then industry-specific UDAP provisions as well. Now, the Bureau thinks it's been comprehensive, but it has requested comment on whether anyone believes any additional laws should be specified in Appendix A. And the way it drafted uh, Appendix A also it's meant to be somewhat of a living uh, appendix because if there's a law that amends or succeeds any identified law, as long as it's materially similar to the predecessor law, it's deemed to be part of Appendix A. That's the way they handle the proposal. That way they don't have to keep constantly revising Appendix A uh, when uh, states make changes. Then also state 
consistent with the FTC Act approach that rules or orders if issued under Section 5 are covered. A rule or order, uh, order uh, issued under uh, any of these identified state laws uh, for purposes of implementing a UDAP prohibition is also covered. So quite uh, quite broad. With that now, I'd like to hand the presentation over to John Culhane, who will address the registration and annual reporting requirements. Thanks, Rich. So I'm going to talk about registration, attestation, and record keeping. There's a little bit of redundancy here because you sort of need to pick up all the definitions that have preceded uh, this discussion. Um, but I, I think we can go through these fairly quickly. So we know uh, who's going to be covered, a non-bank uh, identified by name as a party subject to a covered order. Assuming that you are such an entity, uh, you have 90 days to register, and that 90-day period is either going to run from the effective date of the covered order, or if you're subject to a covered order that runs over uh, into the effective date of the rule, uh, then you've got 90 days from the effective date of the rule. Um, covered orders uh, have a fairly lengthy duration. Um, they're assumed to be in existence for 10 years from the effective date. Um, unless there's an expressly provided termination date. And I, I think we all know that uh, state attorneys general and government agencies are very reluctant to agree to a termination date in their order. Um, the information to be submitted is what you'd expect, a copy of the order identifying the governmental entity that issued it, stating the effective date and any expiration date, the laws that were violated uh, or alleged to have been violated. So let's now talk about attestation, uh, or I think uh, what we're going to be referring to it as uh, is the provision that's going to make it uh, very difficult and very expensive to find a chief compliance officer going forward. So there's an additional requirement for attestation that applies to supervised registered entities. Um, supervised entities are the ones that you'd expect. They're the ones that CFPB can exercise supervisory jurisdiction over. So these are the ones that are identified in Section 1024 of Dodd-Frank. Um, that includes mortgage companies and mortgage servicers, payday lenders, uh, private education lenders, lenders um, entities that are a larger participant under one of the existing larger participant rules, as well as entities as to whom the CFPB has invoked risk-based supervision. Um, you may recall that there was a lot of discussion about this going back to April of last year, the CFPB made it clear that it was going to revive this uh, dormant authority and start designating entities as posing risks and supervising them on that basis. Okay, so those are the entities we're concerned about. Um, who's exempt? There actually are a few entities that are exempt. Service providers that are only service providers are exempt, so this doesn't pick up every vendor of every supervised entity. Um, motor vehicle dealers that stay in their lane and just sell and service are exempt. And then we have a small entity exemption, but you've got to read this very carefully if you're going to rely on the small entity exemption. It picks up the definition of annual receipts that comes from the larger participant rule for consumer reporting agencies. That's basically tax income but it's averaged over periods of time. It also picks up the income of affiliated entities. So if you're going to rely on that, you want to, re want to review that rule and the definition of annual receipts very carefully. So let's talk about the annual uh, attestation requirement. Uh, this is going to be pretty onerous, actually, um, and, uh, and I think it's intended to be onerous. A supervised entity that's subject to this requirement has to annually designate an attesting executive for each covered order. And you probably have to designate an alternative, an alternate too, so that you have somebody available in case your, uh, your designated entity uh, leaves or changes duties or uh, is uh, subsequently put in a position where they're underneath a higher entity. The attesting executive has to be the entity's highest ranking senior executive officer, and it has to be a person who's got specific uh, duties and knowledge and control. So 
um, compliance duties, uh, knowledge of the entity's systems and procedures for complying with covered orders, and control over the entity's compliance efforts. So really, the, the CFPB has made it very clear that they want this attestation coming from the highest applicable level of management. They want this because they think it's going to motivate compliance. Uh, it's going to be an important part of anybody's compliance management system. And they want it because they want to be able to consider an enforcement action against the individual executive who provides the attestation if they decide that the attestation was improper. Um, how does this work? Um, by March 31st of each calendar year, so the end of the first calendar quarter, uh, you're, you, the attesting executive, are going to have to submit to the registration system a signed written statement with respect to each covered order. It has to describe the steps that you've taken to review and oversee the entity's activities that are subject to the order uh, during the previous calendar year. And you have to attest whether to your knowledge, uh, yes or no, uh, no ambiguity here, uh, during the preceding calendar year, uh, any violations were identified or other instances of noncompliance were identified uh, <clears throat> based on a violation of covered law includes injunctive relief, any other legal or equitable relief, any violation. Um, now, I, I, see, the CFPB thinks that entities are or should be uh, already doing this kind of monitoring, um, but they do ask if they should set minimum standards for this kind of review uh, or if they should require additional information here. So let's go to record keeping, and we'll wrap up this part there. Um, you do all of this, and then you have to keep your records for five years after submission uh, to the CFPB. And those documents and records have to be made available to the Bureau upon request, and they have to be in a form that's sufficient for the CFPB to conduct an assessment of compliance. So we all know if this, once this goes into effect, um, they're going to be requested routinely in every exam. Now, Technically, you can submit a notice of non-registration um, as long as you have a good faith to believe either that you are not uh, an entity that's required to uh, comply here or that the order in question is not a covered order. Um, it's, it's really discretionary, but you have to comply once you become aware of facts or circumstances that would uh, make that representation no longer accurate. And the CFPB has said that if you do this um, and they believe it and they believe what you've said, then they won't bring an, they won't bring an enforcement action against you based on failure to comply uh, with uh, without some prior notice and, and opportunity to comply. They talked about looking at an alternative that would be to allow entities uh, to um, skip filing as long as they could show they had a good faith belief uh, that that was uh, not required. But it, it doesn't seem likely that they're going to adopt that, although they did put it out there. Um, Lisa, let me turn it over to you and pass the baton uh, so that you can discuss state requirements in the space that are already in place. Well, thank you, John. Um, so, yeah, I my practice largely focuses on helping non-banks with matters of state law compliance and licensing compliance. Um, so for me, reading through all of this with my colleagues, my general thought has just sort of been, you know, this is superfluous. We've been dealing with this for, for a very long time now. Um, non-banks, as you may know, are required to hold state licenses to engage in a variety of regulated activities as it is. Um, you know, just naming a couple on the, the slide, commercial and residential mortgage brokering, lending and servicing, lead generation, commercial financing, private student loan lending and servicing, and a whole host of other regulated industries. In order to obtain licenses, generally speaking, you apply through the NMLS. There are some, or the nationwide multi-state licensing system and registry. Um, there are some licenses that are administered outside of the NMLS, but by and large, they're all in there. And you have to complete and submit something um, that's called an MU1 form, which includes disclosure questions and disclosure explanation sections that require you to provide yes or no answers to some regulatory action disclosure questions, which, um, moving on to the next slide, 
include in the past 10 years, has any state or federal regulatory agency or foreign financial regulatory authority or SRO ever, you know, and I'll just skip to number four, the bolded language, entered an order against the entity or a control affiliate in connection with a financial services related activity. So anytime that there is a public consent order, you're required to answer yes to something like this. If there's some sort of a public um, action by a regulator against you, you're required to answer yes to these questions um, and to provide an explanation for, for your response, your yes response, which usually includes a copy of the order or whatever it is that the regulator has, you know, you've had to sign with them. Um, just a very high level note here, there are changes that are being proposed to these particular disclosure questions and explanations. Um, we've been discussing it for a while now on the state level at conferences and what have you. Um, generally speaking, it's going to expand the amount of yes answers that non-banks are required to give. Um, we can give you, you know, for anybody that's interested, we can provide you with a copy of those. There's no proposed effective date just yet. We're still sort of working through what that language should be, but you know, by and large, what, what the states are looking for are for you to provide more details about orders or, or actions like this as a part of your disclosure questions and explanations. Um, so, you know, just high level, there's certain things that you should be thinking about on the state level when it is that you're figuring out if you should answer yes or no to a particular question. Um, and generally, the most determinative of the defined terms for you know, making that you know, determination is the definition of the word found. Um, and found includes things like final adverse actions, consent decrees and orders in which the respondent has neither admitted nor denied the findings. And, you know, there's a lot of words here, but generally speaking, it excludes anything that would be private. So if it's any sort of an action that you enter into your, enter into with your state regulator that could be considered public, that isn't labeled some sort of private settlement agreement or private letter agreement, or is just an administrative fine or penalty, you have to answer yes to your disclosure question and provide the proper explanation. So, you know, going through this again, you have to provide your yes response. You have to provide a separate explanation for each event that results in a yes response. So if there are four things that would you would be required to disclose in response to one question, you should be giving four explanations for um, the reasons why you're answering yes. Um, it alerts, submitting a yes answer and a disclosure explanation alerts the other state regulators to the regulatory action triggering the response. So that's a very important distinction here, right? Your, your obligation as a state licensed entity is to go into your record and answer yes or no and provide these responses, which then go to just your state regulators. It's not necessarily publicly disclosed, right? From our perspective, it's the most important people, I guess, right, that are going to be seeing this, which is not always the public, right? Like sometimes these things are very specific and they're not, yeah, I've seen issues with financial statements come up as, as something that requires some sort of a consent order for whatever reason. And it's not anything that the public is, should be concerned about, right? So it's fully within the discretion of your state regulators then to put it up on either a state-specific registry or in the NMLS Consumer Access, which is the public-facing website where you can look up your lenders, your brokers, your servicers, things like that to see, you know, what might be out there. So examples of these Registries include, you know, Illinois, their Department of Financial and Professional Regulations, monthly consolidated reports on enforcement actions. These are things that are publicly available. Um, you can see what's out there. You can read them. There's a couple of states that have state-specific registries, though I wouldn't say that there's a lot of them out there. Um, the second example is the NMLS Consumer Access, which, again, is the public record for consumers to look things up. And you can actually see what's out there by looking up either the, the lender or, you know, entity's name or their NMLS ID. Everybody has a unique ID. Um, and you can actually see what's out there in terms of a regulatory action that the regulators have publicly disclosed. Um, and you can even get copies of those, you know, agreements in whatever form um, it is.
Thanks to all our speakers today, my colleagues in the Consumer Financial Services Group of Ballard Spar. And to make sure that you don't miss our future episodes, subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to check out our blog, ConsumerFinanceMonitor.com, for daily insights on the consumer finance industry. And if you have any questions or suggestions for our show, please email us at podcast at ballardspar.com. That uh, completes our part one of our uh, podcast show for today. Stay tuned next Thursday for part two, which is going to deal with the registry pertaining to contract terms. Thank you for listening and have a good day.